Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 145. My three P's, passion, patience, and perseverance. You have to do this if you got to be a filmmaker. Robert Wise. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Hollywood Camera Work. If you guys are interested in learning how to direct actors and become a actor's director, Hollywood Camera Work has developed an amazing master course called Directing Actors, and it is almost 30 hours, and I've taken this course, and it is by far the most comprehensive directing actors course I have ever seen. So if you want to get access to this course, head over to hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE to get 30% off. That's hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE. Hustle. Today's show is also sponsored by Inside the Edit. If you guys want to learn about editing and the creative process of editing, there is no better resource than Inside the Edit. Now, the creator of it, Patty Bird, has been a multiple time guest on Indie Film Hustle. He's well respected by Avid, by the Editors Union, by uh, every everybody. I mean, this what he's been able to put together is absolutely remarkable. So, if you want to get more information about that, head over to Inside the Edit. Dot com and use the coupon code HUSTLE to get 25% off. That's insidetheedit.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE for 25% off. Now, every once in a while, guys, I come across a filmmaker that is just a little bit crazier than I am. <laughs> and uh, that is today's guest. He is writer-director Galen Cannell, and he has done something that is remarkable. And I'm, I'm going to take you back to how I found this young man and what he's been able to do. Uh, I, get, I get contacted all the time by distributors and, and filmmakers and, and producers who want to be on the show. I only invite people or projects uh, or guests that have some sort of educational value to you guys. Something that I either want to know about or I know you guys want to know about. And that's only time I really bring people on. So I was originally uh, sent this trailer for a film called Blood, Sand, and Gold. And when I saw the trailer, I was like, ah, oh, this is just another big action movie, uh, you know, uh, you know, probably some somewhere made somewhere in Europe. And, you know, and I was like, you know, I, I really, I, I don't have any, there's nothing educational about this, guys. I'm sorry. I, I just don't think it's a good fit for the show. Then they told me the story of how they made it. And they said, hey, you know, Galen made this movie for $250,000. And I said, what? So I went back and looked at that trailer again with those those glasses on, and I'm like, holy crap. This guy was able to put together a movie that looked, had action sequences that were in par almost with James Bond, uh, you know, things out of Casino Royale and uh, things out of a Jason Bourne movie. Uh, I'm, and I'm not bullshitting you guys. I'm, I'm being straight up with you. You know, I was extremely impressed with uh with the production value and then I found out that he shot in five countries over four continents uh on a $250,000 budget. So I said I have to have Galen on the show. I need to find out selfishly how the hell did he do this because he's basically taken what Robert Rodriguez did with $7,000 and just amped it up to a level that is remarkable because at the end of the day it does look really high end and it has a it just feels huge for a budget of $250,000. Now, I know what you guys are going to say, Alex, $250,000 is a lot of money. It is, but not when you're traveling around the world and shooting an action movie with no real kind of, there was kind of a plan <laughs> on how he did it. You know, he'd just like land somewhere and uh, then start looking for actors. I mean, it was insane. So I really wanted to kind of dig in deep uh, about how he was able to do this. And Galen's also an actor. He was in a, one of my favorite movies of the 90s called Chocolat, which was his first movie with Johnny Depp. And um, we talk a little bit about that as well. But he's been an actor, and he decided to jump into directing. Uh, and, you know, everything, if you, if you put this all on paper, and you go, Alex, there's this, you know, this kid actor who now is in his late 20s, and he wants to direct now, and he's going to go off 
around the world with $250,000 and make an action movie. And I, and I, I said the exact same thing everybody else said. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> I wish you the best with that. Let me know how it comes out. You know, it'd be, it'll be fun to watch when you're done with it if it ever gets finished. And uh, that's the kind of attitude he did. He just grabbed the camera and ran. And it's, uh, again, and I say this in the interview, it's, it's basically kind of what I did with This Is Meg, but on a much, 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 much bigger scale. And, you know, I, I, I was so impressed with what Galen did. And I again, I wanted to have him on the show because I wanted to just interrogate him for you guys on how the hell he was able to do what he did. Now, uh, in the show notes at IndieFilmMuscle.com forward slash 145, you'll have a, a small behind-the-scenes video so you can see a little bit about that. He and Galen also uh, wrote a small article on his top five filmmaking tips on what how, how he was able to get blood, sand, and gold made uh, with the kind of uh, – production value that he was able to get. So definitely check that out after you hear the interview. So enjoy my conversation with Galen Cannell. Thank you so much for being on the show, bro. Thank you. I'm a huge fan. Uh, You have some awesome advice that I could have followed making blood, sand and gold. Actually, if I'd listened to your podcast earlier, (laughs) no worries, man. Listen, it's never too late. I've, I, dude, I, I learned stuff on my last movie and I'm like, shit, dude, I've been doing this 20 years. I didn't know that. (laughs) It it just, it's just the way it is, man. So first and for first and foremost, man, one of my favorite films of the late nineties, early two thousands, Chuck a lot. And you're you, going way back. I'm going way back. This is know? the peak of my career. This it's is, all been downhill. It might since be then. the it might be the peak in your opinion, sir. Yep. But um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about working uh, on that set and also working with like kind of like that legendary director, uh, Lacey Hallstrom? Man, he's uh, who just came out Lass- with the, Lassie, Lassie, Lassie Hallstrom. Lassie Hallstrom. You got yeah, it. yeah. I mean, talk so, so. How was that experience? And then, of course, we need a Johnny Depp story. But go ahead. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I was ten years old then. Yes. So it was the first acting job I ever had. It was incredible to be, like I said, (laughs) yeah, it was, it was the peak of my career. It's been downhill since then. Um, I'm just trying to regain that status. No working. I mean, it was, that's what I thought movie making was, you know, we were with (laughs) Carrie Ann Moss, Peter Stormare, (laughs) just like legendary actors. Johnny I don't even think, yeah, I I think my parents were more impressed at the time. I couldn't watch most of their movies. Right. Uh, (laughs) Right. Exactly. At at age 10. Yeah. Like who's this? I don't care about Judy, Judy Dench. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Dame Judy Dench. Um, so it was an incredible experience, incredible cast. We filmed in France and in England. It was, it was a total dream. I mean, when I woke up at age 11, I thought I, I couldn't believe it had happened. Um, and it set me really on the career path that I, that I took today. And I went to film school after that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you, you just looking back, you just realize how fortunate it was to have that, um, at such a young age and be around such talented, unbelievable filmmakers. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it was, it's just an incredible experience. So give us a quick Johnny Depp story. <laughs> Johnny Depp uh, at the premiere, which was in uh, New York City, mm-hmm. and uh, it was sponsored by Godiva Chocolate. What, just a, had what a shock. <laughs> enormous chocolate bunnies and rabbits and all sorts of stuff all over the place. People were just stealing them at the end or taking them home or putting them in their jacket. Um, you know, Johnny Depp was was a big, big name then. He still is now. <laughs> yeah, he's, and, he's, uh, he's doing okay yeah. now for himself too. Yeah. I've heard of him. I've heard of him. Uh, no, it was like – you had access to all those people as a 10 year old because he didn't want to deal with the paparazzi. He didn't want to deal with the adults, but at, at the premiere, you know, he sees the 10 year old kids from the movie. He says, hey, come on over. Let's hang out, get to hang out with them. Uh, not, not a Johnny Depp, but Carrie Ann Moss of matrix fame. Mm-hmm. She would, uh, we were getting tutored on set cause we still had to go to school. Right. So we had a, a tutor and there was a, there was a trailer the same way you have other, uh, trailers for actors on set. And she would just come in, um, and tell the teacher, like, we're done with class for the day. I'm going to just do painting with the kids now. <laughs> <laughs> Which was like all-time badass move. Right. Well, she is um, Trinity, so, I mean, there is that. Exactly. There is that. There is that. <laughs> so, yeah, just being around those people is just incredible looking back um, and, and knowing that I had that opportunity was, was, was really beautiful. So you started off, obviously, as an actor. And now what made you want to jump into directing and producing? I just I started working behind the camera. I, I started making films right after Chocolat, you mm-hmm. know, on a, a Sony VX two thousand. I mm-hmm. think was one of the first cameras I had. Right. Um, and I was they had premieres like early premiere. Ooh, that's that. I'm sorry to hear that. That's yeah. that's 
That's a rough statement, man. Um, <laughs> it's like editing on Final Cut One. It's like ooh, it's like on a Steinbeck. Uh, <laughs> no, that's actually better. A Steinbeck would have been better. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So, so no, I, I edited that, and then, uh, and then I went to film school at at NYU. Um, but you know. I feel like with this movie that we made, Blood, Santa, Gold, uh, it, it was really something that I'd always dreamed to do. I always wanted to make an action movie. I always wanted to make an adventure movie. That's what inspired me. And, you know, it was it was a total challenge to get to that point because nobody thought we could make a movie in five countries around the world with no budget, with no sign-off from people in Hollywood. Um, oh, so, like – right. One of the things, yeah, one of the one of the big things I wanted to share was just like some of the the tricks that we we did on that film on Blood, Sand, and Gold. That if you're listening to the podcast right now, that you could do right now if you wanted to go out and make a movie to make your movie look like it's a two hundred thousand two hundred million dollar movie when when it really wasn't because we we had to employ these throughout the whole film to make it look badass. Well, we will we will definitely get into all of that. But first and foremost, people who don't are just listening and just tuning in, yes. Blood Santa Gold is um is a, a Galen's first uh, directorial debut, correct? As far as a feature film is correct. Is that right? correct? That's right. Correct. And a hell of a debut it was. I was approached uh I was approached for a Galen to come on the show and uh, when they asked me they're like, "Hey, you know, would you like to have this uh, this director on the show?" And I looked at the the trailer and I just Said, oh, it's just another big action movie, you know, international action movie. I, I, it's both I'm a like, good and bad thing. I am like, like, like uh, it, no, no, but you yeah. know what I mean. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah. it's just another beautiful big action movie. I'm like, I'm like, look, I, I really, you know, my my listeners need like kind of like gritty in the in the in the in the in the, right. in the back alley of Hollywood, as I right. say, uh, kind of information. And I'm like, I don't know what this. Is. And then they told me the budget, and I'm like, wait, what? And then, and then I went dug a little deeper, and and just the production value of the film is insane. It's absolutely insane. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your journey from script to mm-hmm. actually giving someone giving a first time director, quote unquote, um, a quarter of a million dollars uh, to mm-hmm. the point that you get to, on, to the first day on set. Okay, so yeah, so Blood Santa Gold action adventure film. It's in the vein of Indiana Jones. It's a treasure hunt, modern day treasure hunter. Uh, we filmed it in. Five countries all across the world in Mexico, in Hong Kong, in Switzerland, uh, in Dubai, and in Morocco. That's sick. And we and we filmed it over something like fifty seven production days, which was totally insane. And I think you someone got 50, said that you have Spielberg 50. shot Lincoln in fifty three. Like so, you got fifty seven production days. It was in the high fifties. That's ridiculous. I can't, was, okay, please continue. It was totally insane. Please continue, um, sir. Yes, and, and no, no, and and so, uh, <laughs> and we did it with no help from basically anybody in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. I mean, people were like, "Okay, go go live the dream, buddy." Yeah. You know, oh no. no that, one, uh, look, if you call me and you tell me this, dude, I'll be like, yeah. "You're like, you're out of your fucking mind." I'm sorry. <laughs> like, you're out of your mind. There's no, no possible no, way. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. And and it's like, real. I, I I'm touched that people think that we had more money. Mm -hmm. Because that's great. I mean, but I wish we did have more money. Mm -hmm. Um, But no, and and the movie has explosions, helicopters, action sequences. I mean, we tried to do our ode to a big budget, you know, action adventure film that I've grown up loving and and that that I, you know, through film school, I was like, this is the kind of movie I want to make. And and that's what I wanted to do. But I, I could not have done that without a lot of the technological advances that we have now and then a lot of kind of tricks that we had planned the movie around to make the most of a tiny budget Mm -hmm. and and that was really before we as we were making the script we had to keep that in mind because we knew we were going to make the movie and so we had to write the script around what we had it was a little bit like the robert rodriguez style of filmmaking where he's like (laughs) figure out all the props you have and then write the movie but instead of a turtle Uh, you had a helicopter (laughs) <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, but but there was one thing when I when I set out to do this movie that I knew that would help us, and this is kind of like the first the first the first tip I would say is I knew filming and traveling outside of the country is a lot cheaper than you think. Mm-hmm. So 
our cast and crew, the core crew members, our, we took a plane ticket that went from New York to Mexico, mm -hmm. Mexico to China, mm -hmm. China to Dubai, Dubai mm -hmm. to Morocco, Morocco to Switzerland, and then Switzerland back to New York. We went around the globe once. We mm -hmm. circumnavigated it once. And, that's a, that, and I've, I've actually done a little travel hacking, so that is – that you get a much better deal when you do a worldwide ticket like that because you have layovers, you right? Adding on, you just keep adding on into one ticket, and you make the layovers be the you know last a week or last right. six days. Mm -hmm. So the actual ticket for each of us was something like seventeen hundred bucks each to do that <laughs> for two months. Which was like that's it, but that's a huge know that, but that's a know, huge travel hack. That. Yeah, that's a huge travel track. A lot of people don't know that, but I actually doing research on travel hacking found that that's that's one of the big keys. Like you can travel the world on twenty uh, two thousand bucks because they want to get you on the leg that you're paying for, and then they'll show they'll put you on a leg that's that's cheaper. I don't know <laughs> the whole details. There's probably yeah. podcast about that, but sure. I'm saying it was like seventeen hundred bucks each a person. And how many is, and how many people did you have? And, and the, other, the second thing we did when we designed this is we said, what do we really need? We're going to the middle of the Sahara Desert. We need a camera. We need some beautiful lenses. It's not like we're going to have a lot of rental equipment outside of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do this if the locations speak for themselves and the practical effects speak for themselves. We can do this with a documentary style crew. Mm -hmm. And so we just had a producer, a, a director, myself. And uh, well, you, you are the direct, you are the director. You mean? Sorry, uh, sorry. A producer, <laughs> sorry, yeah, a producer, director, uh, a, a a a camera person, a, a DP, mm -hmm. director of photography, mm -hmm. and um, and one other person who was doing kind of pulling focus. Any sound? And was and, and, the whole crew. How about a sound guy? Or did you pick up sound guys along no, the way? No, our producer did the sound guy. Oh, but producer, okay. Producer did the sound. <laughs> so you had four. You basically had a four man crew. We had a four man crew outside of Mexico. Okay, and, and that and that was and then and your talent, your two pieces, your two main talent. Yep, and then we brought and then we brought our two, the lead actor and the lead actress, Monica West and Aaron Costaganis. Mm -hmm. And then we flew whoever needed to be for certain scenes mm -hmm. out just for that part. Okay, you mean actors? You mean? Yep, whoever, okay. whatever kind of actors we needed. So, mm -hmm. but we were basically a, a bare bones crew, and and the reason I say, kind of like something that you can do immediately, and and I, I, this may be controversial, but we filmed everything outside of the country, and there was something, and and you could do this definitely in in different parts of the U.S., but there was something incredibly magical about going to places where people don't often see film production, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because. They were so helpful in a way that, you know, if I bust out a camera right now in New York City, people would be like, you have a permit. Yeah, you know, same here in L.A. Of them. course, of course. Right, exactly. And it's nothing <laughs> against, it's just people see this so much, it's not, it's not as exciting. Mm -hmm. But, for example, when we were filming in Mexico, we needed a big scene with a bunch of people to show up. And, you know, we, we, got, our, we got our friends, we got people on Facebook to come show up for this big party scene. And it's the scene in the movie where the bad guy shows up in like a badass car. Mm -hmm. And so we had rented a car and the car never showed up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were like 200 people were there, 200 extras. We're filming everything in the scene. We're giving them free alcohol. So they're all getting drunk. So there's kind of a time limit on. <laughs> well, you could shoot because of just yeah. basically yeah. alcohol poisoning. Got it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and. A friend, we're, we're freaking out because the, the rental car, the nice rental car we had didn't show up. And a friend of a friend of a friend was like, oh, they're shooting a movie. I'll bring my $200,000 $200, Mercedes SLS to the set. Nice. Which has the, which has the doors that rise up on the side. Mm -hmm. Back to the and, future style. right? <laughs> exactly. And, and it just was like a dude who, he wanted a Facebook photo. You know, he wanted to like, he wanted to be part of a film production and get a Facebook photo with him in front of the you know, with his car there and everything. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened on the other side of the world in Morocco is we were filming the opening scene of the movie, which they're finding this treasure chest and we're in the middle of the Sahara desert. <laughs> we don't have a treasure chest, right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Of course <laughs> we could, we, put, we couldn't bring it on the plane. All right. Um, and there's a guy like a local guy who was like totally down with helping out with the movie. He said, dude, my, my dad, 
he's got a bunch of like old chests that he sells at the market. You can totally just rent one for the day. But let me. Uh, so, so I mean, okay. So you're you're now traveling. You're 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 a world globe trotter at this point right. in the game. Um, you've got four basically four main cast. I mean, four main people with you. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, there has to be logistics when you land, like. Who's you know who's booking the hotels? Who's getting like who's jumping to these locations? Like who did who did all this research? I mean, because it can't be you guys. I, I gotta believe I mean, unless your producer is a super producer, which at that point I want his name. But <laughs> well, he, he, he is a super producer. Okay, he, he is a super producer. Okay, um, his name's Francisco Arias Flores. Okay, and I, if you ever want to make an action movie like we did, uh-huh. use him. Okay, uh, but it brings to the second kind of kind of tip that I'd say for filmmakers, which is use Airbnb. And I say this because Airbnb, or, or it doesn't have to be specifically Airbnb, but but use an online platform where you can rent someone's house mm-hmm. or rent someone's place. And this was invaluable because what we did is we would pick out the scenery we wanted. So we wanted to go to the Sahara Desert. We wanted to film the dunes. Mm-hmm. So the closest city there is the city, tiny city called Merzuga in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And there was this one German lady who's got her house on Airbnb there. And it's something like $65 a night. And it, it sleeps like eight people. (laughs) So, so, and, and, and you literally walk outside and it's like the most beautiful sand dunes, you know, it's like Lawrence of Arabia. Right. So, so we would, we picked these Airbnbs and each of the countries near the areas that we wanted to, we would stay there as a crew and then we'd also have a location to film. Uh, let me give you another example. Another place in Morocco is called Chef Shawan, where we went. And we picked it literally based on a Google search because it's the entire city is dyed blue. All the walls of the entire city. Yeah, are yeah, they're gorgeous. It's, it's beautiful. And it's like world famous. So there's, a, there's an Airbnb. <laughs> there's a woman, a Spanish lady, a very nice, who, who uh, rents her like four story apartment building that's in the historic downtown. It's all blue. It's like, it's, mm-hmm, like a, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a castle. Yeah. And so we showed up there two, three days before we knew we were going to film in the city and we used the rooftop of the building to film a scene. We mm-hmm. used a, a really beautiful, beautiful room inside of it to film a police station scene. And and it was our home base. All the actors, the, the crew we had, we all stayed there. Are, are you right? Are you writing a little bit as you go along? Like basically rewriting certain things just based on around the locations you have or the we, things that come we up? Definitely, we, we definitely had to improvise. Okay. We definitely had to improvise. Um, and that's another thing I would say to anybody is you have to prepare to improvise. And, and we did that not just not just to, to make something work but to make something look better. So I know these stories sound outrageous but mm-hmm. everything's true, I swear. No, no, no. It does. No, no, but I'm, I'm – yeah, go ahead. So, so, so an example of how we improvised to make the movie look better is we were filming um, some explosion sequences in Mexico, and we were filming this like okay. So, so stop right there. Stop, stop, stop right there. How did you get the explosions? How did you get the pyrotechnic guy? Because I, I can't believe you just grabbed a bunch of fireworks and blew shit up. So how did you? I, I want to take it step by step. How did okay, you get that dude? Right, we're going step by step. We're going step by step. All right. How, how'd you get that dude? So, I, I know there's a lot. I know there's a big push right now. You know, everyone has the ability on their computer to make special effects, to mm-hmm. do all of that. And I think that's great. But for us, for our budget, going practical was extremely cheap. For mm-hmm. example, having someone, you know, render out, build all the, the composite stuff. I don't have that skill set. No one on our crew had that skill, skill set for mm-hmm. explosions. Mm-hmm. But we purchased. A pirate. We got a pyrotechnic guy, and the bombs that we set off in our movie, they're only fifty dollars. I'm not making that up. Okay, they're, they're but you fifty dollars, and you were doing it in a non-populated area, and you had you did have a pyro yes. guy there. We had a pyro guy. He was in Mexico. He's done a bunch of films. He was he was relatively inexpensive as well. But he was like Galen. Look, each of these things cost me fifty dollars. <laughs> so was, you're like give me like, 10 put in everything <laughs> give me 10 let's, let's, add, let's add more explosions so we're doing one sequence we're ta- you're talking about improvisation we're doing one sequence um 
where in Mexico where where we we'd blown up stuff. We were in a rural area and uh, and part of the scene after the explosion, there were all these like oil cans and mm-hmm. they were all burning on fire. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we said like, look, this is like a a sick sick backdrop. And of course, there I'm 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 telling it like it's like it was totally rogue there were safety people there etc right i was gonna i was gonna ask safety people also i mean generally speaking when you have explosions happening on the countryside um aren't people gonna call the cops are the are the police or local authorities aware of what you're doing i'm assuming there are no permits but like these are people in the neighborhood nearby did call the cops okay um and they just came and kind of like hung out with us of course because there's nothing else to do got it Uh uh-huh and we we begged forgiveness after the fact um oh. it, was, it, was really, it was like a it was like a ruin it, it we were way out in the countryside there was not there was no like so really you okay so let me just because i gotta i gotta break this down for for <laughs> everybody i gotta break yeah. because you're going at a mile, a mile a minute so i i gotta i gotta break it down so you went out into the rural countryside of mexico with a pyro guy and a bunch of explosions you basically asked no permission from anybody uh, uh <laughs> okay so, okay okay so then there was permission Okay. Most of that is correct. Okay. We did have permission to to use the site we were filming on, which okay. was like an abandoned castle. Okay. So the the owner of that property knew what was going on. Yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we were making a movie. Okay. Great. So you had permission from the landowner, but no authorities were asked about anything uh, as far as police or, God forbid, a film commission uh, or anything <laughs> like that. Right? Am, am I? Am I? I'm, I'm on. I'm on point so far. Uh. I want to say you're 98 percent there. Okay, but but this one of the other great things about filming film is is Guadalajara, for example. Sure, they have people that work for the government that are a part of the film commission. Okay, and they had no movies that they were making at the time. Uh-huh. So these two people who work for the government literally were full time working on our film. Got so it. We, we would get calls like, "Hey, do you want to?" Uh, you know, we have like a jail. You guys had asked for a jail. We have like a real jail that you guys can film at today. And, you know, we'd say, okay, let's, let's go right now. Let's get this shot of, of the main character walking out of prison for the opening of the movie. So I, I, I love this, man. I really do. I'm I'm so, I'm sorry. I just, I just love this improv, like, you know, screw it attitude. Just like, Hey, we're just going to go down to Mexico. We have a bunch of stuff we're going to shoot and things will just happen. Things are just going to pop up. <laughs> I think it, I think that goes back to what I was saying, which is like if you film in an area, one if you're really cool with people, mm-hmm, of and, course, and you and, you're, and, and you film and you're nice, people will help you out. But if you film in an area that that doesn't often see films, mm-hmm. they're totally it's it's like it's exciting, it, yeah, and it's, it's super seeing exciting. Films as a magical thing, not a nuisance, not something that <laughs> right, you know, <laughs> not like you know, here, which is. Yeah, I mean, I shoot a bunch of commercials too, and it's like you know, the, everything's permitted, everything, whatever. You know, you have a dog, dog walking around on set. You have like seventeen different people from different organizations there just for the dog. Oh, God, you know? I know. yeah, I and know. that's great. But I think when you're making a film, that's art, you know, and mm-hmm. you want to have complete freedom, and you don't want to be. It's not about being dangerous or reckless, but it's about just like being able to, you know, have that freedom to oh. go create. I feel. I look. I, I I did exactly what you did, but on a much much smaller scale. With this is Meg with my little movie, and right. is exactly. But it's exactly the same plan. I was like, I want my freedom. I want to go out. I just want to. You know, it's just me and two other guys. What do I actually need to go make the movie? You just amped everything up to a thousand. You know, so instead of a small character piece, you've made a huge action movie. <laughs> Which is and I, and I hope more people are going to start talking about this because I'm gonna I'm gonna well, scream it from, I'm gonna scream it from the top of the the hills on this because it's it's inspiring man and you don't this hasn't ha- I, honestly I haven't I haven't seen anything like this before I haven't heard of anything like this before it might have happened I just don't know about it uh, well, thank you. but and and we have more stuff to talk about but let, we'll, we'll get into the gushing later go ahead continue mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so so. No, no. So it's just kind of I, I forget where we were. Where we're we, I here. think we were. Um, there was uh, explosions that you are working with people. Uh, yeah, you were working. Right. Yeah, people just called oh. the Mexican. Uh, the Mexican <laughs> government officials. Yes, uh-huh. that's, that's the recap right there. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Next. Yeah. There's explosions, <laughs> and we're in Mexico, and, and dreams are happening. Yes, exactly. Um, so no, and, and just preparing to improvise. So we were doing this explosion sequence, and uh, and 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 the the set was actually like kind of catching on fire. We had, you know, we could have put it out. 
it was ready to be put out, but it was like, this is this unbelievable backdrop that we hadn't set up for of these flames burning in front of the castle. You know, Chris, our main, main guy, our main bad guy said like, let's go, let's go, let's go film here. Let's get you like in front of all of this mm-hmm. again, not, not in a dangerous way, mm-hmm. but and he was like, he was like, heck yeah. You know, everyone on the movie would recognize kind of how absurd it was that we were doing. Mm-hmm. And this is something, it, it looks like a, you know, the final sequence that wasn't planned. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Mm-hmm. It was supposed to be explosions and then some other shots. And instead we have like the bad guy crawling through, you know, burning rubble. It's, bl- it's like a Michael Bay film. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of just like we tried to steal those moments whenever we had. The idea was really like if you put it in one thing, it was like, how awesome will it be if you have one great camera, some beautiful lenses, a couple fake guns, and you land in the middle of the Sahara Desert? I mean, no matter what you make, it's going to look badass. You know? well, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, you, if, could point the, you could point the camera in any direction and you're like, all right. And it's lit. It's, and we're lit. Yeah, this Ooh. is some mind-blowing stuff. Yeah, we're lit. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to back up real quick um, because yep. I ha- because I know a lot of my audience is going to want to know this. How did you get the budget? Who is yeah. the maniac who gave you a quarter of a million dollars to do this? Right. So and you don't have to say names, but just tell me in general. No, no, no. So there was there was three parts of this, and and I don't want to lose anyone here. I I was on before I did this. I was on a, a Cartoon Network TV show mm-hmm. um, for a while, and and I made some money during the, doing doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I wanted to make this movie, it's it's tough. I wanted to have like complete freedom. Mm-hmm. So I took the amount, whatever money that I had saved up from acting, mm-hmm. and I just I put it all into this. My bank account had like six hundred bucks after after the end of this movie. So you financed um, a, a chunk of this. I financed a chunk of it, and then what I did, and it's this I think is the only way to operate is I told two other people in Hollywood that had known me that were connected loosely with films um, and wanted to invest in some type of movies that I had just known through my network. Mm -hmm. And I said, listen, we're going to start filming this. I'm putting up the budget right now. We're going to film this. I believe in this. I don't have sign off from anybody else, but if you believe in this too, see what we're doing and, and, and help us out. And no one knew this at the time on the set, but the budget that I had would not have gotten us through the whole film. Oh my God, you're a maniac. I love no. it. No, you're, <laughs> but, you're an insane man. Go ahead. But, but, but when, we were, when we were there, you know, and, and in week one we filmed, and we'll talk about this because I know you're a big gear guy. Yeah. Uh, we talked about, we, we filmed some drone stuff, we filmed some explosion stuff, and I sent this footage back to Los Angeles. And, you know, these people are like, all right, this is nuts, you know, here, here we go. But it was the, it was the attitude the attitude where you're, you're basically just saying, look, the train is leaving the station and you can either get on it or get off, but, but it's going, man. I, I mean, how, do you mind me asking how old you are? I'm 27. Okay. Cause you, you, you have basically the same attitude I had when I was 27, uh, uh which, is, which is, which is, which is, which is, which is, which, which you're a maniac. Um, because <laughs> as a general state, it's, it's a, and I say this in a good and bad way as a yeah. general statement. And I've been on those projects where the train left the station. I've yeah. been close to projects where the, the train left the station and then the train derails and more, yeah. more often than not, the train derails. Um, yeah. so you were really rolling the dice hard and not only on your idea, your dream, your vision, but on your pocketbook, <laughs> your wallet. Yep. Uh, excuse me, not your pocketbook, but your wallet. Years, years from now when I try and buy a house and can't, I'll blame this. But for the <gasps> moment, this was, I would never – I don't regret anything. I mean, no, and you shouldn't. This and, was like – this you, was the thing I, I would wake up every night, literally wake up every night, wake my girlfriend up and say, you know, I have to make this action movie. I have to make it. Like that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And she's like, all right. Let's go do go it. Go for it. Go for yeah, it. Do no, it. no, no, no. It's, you, it's, don't, you don't want to show up 15 years down the line and be like, well, everything's pretty cool now, but, but I didn't get to do that one thing. 
Right. And that's, and that's, I think, a, a lesson that we, that everyone listening should to take in is just like, you know, man, sometimes you just got to put your balls on the, on the table and they might get slapped. <laughs> they, yeah. might, they might get, they might yeah. get cut off, but. Uh, and, I, and I'm happy to share, like, at the, at the, I know we were going to talk about this later, but I'm happy to chat about like five things that I did wrong. Oh, yeah. Well, film we, we'll, I guarantee other people should not do, and I'd, I'd hope would help them in terms of not doing. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll get to that. that. Into this. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get into that. Now, I wanted to also ask you because when I did see the movie, I saw one thing that was not there generally in a action movie in today's world, which is mm-hmm. big name actors or marketable yes. name actors that could sell territories. That is a general. You I just got there. You just got to. You just got to. Tip number one of what, <laughs> what I could have done better. Okay, and what we could have done better. So, t- so uh, tell me why you didn't? Act, because I mean, on this budget lit range, you could have easily gotten uh, a face or a name for a day. Shoot him out in Mexico. Shoot him out in Dubai. Shoot him out, mm-hmm. and then that guy's on the poster. In the general idea of what distributors are looking for, and with these kind of movies, which are action adventure movies, right? I've never seen an action adventure movie at this scale. Knowing that I know what your budget is, but at least at this perceived scale, uh, right. without any faces or names in it that um, that bring money to the table as far as distribution is concerned. So please enlighten us. Yes, well, <laughs> I mean that's that's something that I I learned the hard way. Okay, I think in kind of the reckless. I don't want to say reckless. Uh, in, <laughs> no, it's reckless, dude. It's reckless. It's it's yeah, wonderfully in, in it's wonderfully reckless. It together, <laughs> uh-huh. you know, I was also under the impression that one of the reasons was what you said that the plus side of what you said, which is that an, the action film, the crime genre, the horror genre tend to have legs in a lot of international film markets, mm-hmm. you know, but I figured that they may have legs just based on the effects in the story, mm-hmm. not necessarily with the name. So that's, that's wrong. <laughs> if, you're out there, if you're out there and you're listening, if you're out there and you're listening right now, yeah. do yeah. what Alex said. <laughs> I appreciate Before that. you make your movie, find a name, any name, put them, kill them off in the first scene. I don't care. Rotoscope them in in the title sequence. You know, yeah. they just have to be there on the poster so that some guy that you've never met who's asking about the film years later is like, well, is so and so in it? Great. And it checks his box. You know, and that's the hard truth. All right. Um, Aaron and Monica are unbelievable actors, both of them, mm-hmm. and Christopher Redman and everybody else we had. And, and they, and they, have awesome performances in the film mm-hmm. truly mm-hmm. but but they don't have that name that right now that that some guy like i said that i've never met who's who's buying the rights for china or buying the rights for the airlines or mm-hmm. buying the rights for morocco or whatever mm-hmm. needs and he has his little list and he says okay i need this person in it to get x price so that's something definitely going back i would i would have changed and i think also there was there's a there was a double edged sword there changed because i love the actors that are in the film but i would have included someone that. right you would have yeah exactly but there and there's something to be said though i mean what you've done um is is great but you could and, and when you were starting out like you basically had no um street cred you had not done a feature so it would have been right. really difficult for you to get somebody on board as well to go on this crazy adventure you're speaking my mind. I think there was a real catch twenty two that I right. fought against, and I think we all we all can, as as filmmakers, and this mm-hmm. is why I love your show so much because it's like a voice of reason amongst you know <laughs> insanity. <laughs> how, yeah, but how it really is, you right? Know? And I think we all struggle. There's a real catch twenty two in Hollywood. And oh. there's no other way to say it, which is that you can't get it unless you you've done it, and you can't do it unless you've done it. Right. right. And and so looking at it from my perspective, if a first time director who's in their 20s, no offense, uh, but in their 20s, who have not directed a lot uh, other than some short films and someone's like, hey, we're going to go around the world and make a movie. Uh, tradition uh, or logic states that um, as an actor, you have to be a little nutty, too. To right. jump on exactly. that, to jump on that bandwagon. So a name actor, even a face that's worked a lot in television or anything like that, it's a risk for them to do something like this. Now, if you do this exact same model today, you have Blood, Sand, and Gold as a reference. You will be able to generate. You will be able to get other actors to jump on that journey with you right. because now right. you've got that street cred. But you couldn't. It would have been a little bit difficult, and or you would have had to have paid a lot for that. That right. one, that one actor to come out for the day, and there's, there's, two, I have two good stories that mm-hmm. will enlighten this point. Good. So one is, um, one is what we tried to do here 
I know you've talked about this. I think you just had a podcast like a few days ago about this, Mm -hmm. um, which is that I always say when you're making a movie, it's so much of it is teamwork, but you have to be nice. And there's two parts about this. One is you have to be nice because being nice to people, you're going to already have a built in network when you're going out to promote it. Right. Right. But number two is what we try to do with this movie. When you recognize that filmmaking is a huge team sport, we tried to do something that I haven't seen yet. And I think we should start to see more as, as uh, people start making more films at different lower budget points is structure the movie. Like you structure startups. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show, which is that every single person, not just the actors, Every single person, I'm talking about the casting director, the mm-hmm. assistant directors, every single person who's working those 16-hour days should have some percentage back end. In our movie, we made sure of that. So every single person who was part of this film, mm-hmm. whether it's sound mixing, whatever it is, they all get a percentage back end on the sales of Blood, Sand, and Gold. Mm-hmm. That's, and that's awesome. Hu- that's hugely important. That's, and that's how businesses are set up nowadays, mm-hmm. you know, especially mm-hmm. high rate. Filmmaking to me is so much like a startup because you're basically building a prototype product, you're getting an investment for it, mm-hmm. and you won't find out for two years whether it's going to sell on the market. So there's <laughs> right. a huge risk involved. Right. And, and so for me, setting up the movie like that just made sense. And it also made sense in terms of, and, and I'm sure most of your audience already, know, already knows this, but actors do get this. You know, actors' deals typically have this, producers may have this, mm-hmm. directors mm-hmm. have this. Mm-hmm. But you don't get it in a lot of the other integral parts of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't, you know, the, the, the gaffer for the day is not going to get a not going to get a back end percentage. Mm-hmm. But if that gaffer is there for sixteen hour days flying around the world, not making a lot of money, you gotta, they definitely uh, deserve it. You got to toss him a bone, no question about it. Absolutely. If if you're if I mean the kind of I mean the kind of schedule and what you were trying to do. Uh, this makes perfect sense. Uh, but generally speaking, as a producer, what you do is normally you just pay out their day uh, and and so on. But if you're not able to pay out their day, um, uh, depending on – especially with the kind of stress that you were putting these poor people <laughs> under, it makes perfect sense. Which also which brings me to another question I had about – because I read this in another article about this movie. Um, you made a deal with SAG about premiering your film online first to get what – the, what was that deal you made with SAG? Yeah, well, actually, I I don't believe this contract is around anymore. Okay, but it was the for four years it was around with the new new media contract. Oh, okay, so that's yes. a, okay. Which is which is I I don't know how familiar you are with it, but mm-hmm. it it is basically as long as your film is going to be premiered on video on demand or online on an online platform platform first, mm-hmm. there's just separate rates and separate rules about doing it. Mm-hmm. Um. And so that was that was something we did for this movie, and it was the only way we could do do it for the movie because typically, uh, typically a SAG uh, rate for filming overseas is like a thousand dollars a day or something, if not if more, outside the country, sure, if not more. Mm-hmm. But but and and it, this wasn't an issue of money. I mean, the issue was the rules are there. Look, I'm in SAG. I respect SAG. I, mm-hmm. I love what they do. Mm-hmm. But but Aaron, Monica, the crew, they all wanted to do this, so we just had to work out what what made sense for financially for the film and then for them to make sure they were comfortable. Got it. Uh, but that, but that's, I think another, I wanted to share one other story mm-hmm. about, about getting actors is when you have nothing to lose, you know, you can ask for stuff. So for example, we had one actor in the film this happened a few times, but I was also emailing with agents and everything. And we were going to bring them down for two days for one scene, you know, and it was like an easy scene and they get to hang out with a bunch of like cool animals and whatever. And I think their, their, uh, agent was like, okay, that's fine. Their, their rate is, their rate is $4,000 for the day. <laughs> of course their agent would say that. And I was like, I, I have the email. Yeah. And I said, that's great. I'm going to give you $200 uh-huh. and a plane ticket to Mexico. Let me know if they're in. Uh huh. And the next day, they said, "Ah, oh, they're not busy this weekend. That's fine. We'll do it." And the guy, <laughs> I mean, it turned out the guy was like, you know, he, he thought it was the most amazing experience ever. 
Of course. You know what I mean? Of course. And, and I'm not saying that's for everybody. That's not a, it's not like a, you know, something that could work all the time, but, mm-hmm. but there's no harm in asking, you know, because you never know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're not saying, look, I'm going to, I look at, I need $200 and we're going to go up into the winter of Wyoming. Like it's right. not, it's like, no, we're like, you know, we're going to Dubai, we're going to Mexico, we're and, going to Hong Kong. Re- right. And they recognize the fact that on this film, it was such an experience and mm-hmm. the whole, for the whole crew is such an experience. I mean, this was something that you say stressful. There was definitely stress, but I think you could ask anyone on the crew. Yeah. It's uh, just, yeah. This was like a once in a lifetime of course. memorable trip, and we had a hell of a lot of fun. Of course, it so. sounds it sounds like it. You had a well when you have such a small crew, you've got to have this. You, and they're uh, all my, you know, all friends. You know, they're all the the DP Chloe, the you know the the assistant camera Camillo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All of these people were like friends, and now now we're tied together for life because I mean we've seen some stuff, <laughs> <laughs> which we could discuss off air. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, uh, so by the way, you, whoever did your drone operation on this, yes. insane. I've I've seen a lot of man. I you know I work on movies all the time, and I've seen a lot of drone, and it's just garbage. It's just always with a GoPro or some thing shooting like MP an MP4 right. like with like right. no, at standard depth. I mean, it's just horrendous it really really is and when i started seeing when i looked at your movie i was like wow this oh he put a real camera on a drone which i don't know i don't know why filmmakers don't do it as much because i mean you can get a a, like and i think you shot this on a black magic because i kind of recognize the the style we shot we shot so we put a black magic on the uh drone Mm -hmm. we shot on it just a scarlet Mm -hmm. just a just a red scarlet and then we put we had a cook s4 lenses which are beautiful you rented them for like two months? Or yeah, whatever? we rented them. And that was another thing. When you rent something past like a month, yeah. the price never goes up. <laughs> it's like it's right. like they peak out. They're like, all right, you just, just take them. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the rental house. So yeah, the, the, there were two brothers who did the, um, did the drone operating. They were fantastic. One of them controlled the camera. One of them controlled the, the, uh, the helicopter. They had, a, they had built an octocopter mm-hmm. themselves that they, that they used. It's pretty insane. Um, yeah, and they just—I mean, it was like it was—it was our prototype was there's there's a few sequences. One of my favorites where a- Aaron is walking through, you know, w- doing this huge mountain trek. Our, our lead yeah. actor, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, and our prototype was just Lord of the Rings. You know, every travel sequence in Lord of the Rings, and that's what they did. These insane kind of three sixty degree swoops. You see the whole landscape. You know, I mean, these guys were these guys were such pros. But I want to bring this to a point. Controversial point here, Alex. I love controversy. You know, are you me. ready? Yes. Okay, you're gonna fight me on this. Go for it. Oh, I even like it better. In Go this, in this film. I feel like as a filmmaker right now, mm-hmm. gear does not matter. As Absolutely, much, as people argue about. All I, I, that's not. That, I'm not gonna okay. fight you on that. I actually did an entire podcast. I'm like, no one gives a crap about the camera you shoot Thank on. You. Thank you. As long as it looks good. I mean, there is that. There is a level of quality. But I mean, I had Sean Baker on who. Who was like a, a sold a sold a tangerine? He shot it on an iPhone, yeah, you know, and it yes, looked exactly. it, it looked great, you know. But he also and I always I always preface them like he knows what he's doing. This was his right. fifth feature. He had a real nice DP, and they did everything right on how to shoot an iPhone. They did just grab the phone out of their pocket and start shooting a movie. They planned it. They shot with special software. But you have to understand. But yeah, but like in today's world, no one cares. No I one think cares. it's I think it's like. Definitely, it matters in the sense that we've gotten to the point where we can do stuff for so much cheaper. That's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that the Scarlet to purchase it is like six grand or something. Or let, to, you know, to, I, I own, I own, I owned it, and to own it with a to like actually make it work. Oh, with the whole thing with like like, like no, not even you could probably get a, a nice Scarlet like bare bone, no lenses, probably about a ten to twelve. Is a, okay, it's okay. about about the world with like with the monitor and the cards and right, 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 basics right. just to make it work about ten to twelve. But dude, you can go buy a Black Magic uh, Ursa Mini it, uh, for yeah. five, and it's yeah. insane. And 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 it's like so so it's gotten us to that point, and the fact that you can do drone shots now that that's a that's a easy easily easily used tool that mm-hmm. everybody has now in their toolbox. You know, which before it used to, to. which before was like ex- a completely cost prohibitive trying to get a helicopter pilot and oh my god and yes. trying to get heli- with a gimbal at the front and the and the, yeah, the gyro the yeah 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 crazy awesome so definitely that's helped 
so much time about like what camera we're going to shoot on and what whatever. And it's like, like you said, it's just they're all, you know, no one, no one's going to the theater looking at the pixel count. No, no one's one going cares. to the theater, you know, looking at what what kind of color color thing you you put on in the back end. They want to know if the story's there and they want to be entertained. At the and end, if, if if that's an iPhone, then shoot it on an iPhone. But that it shouldn't. It should not prohibit you from going out to make your movie. Right, and that's the thing. And I, and I'll and I'll make this one quick statement. And it's and it's absolutely true. It's like, look, guys. At the end of the day, you could shoot. I shot Meg on a basically a fifteen hundred dollar camera, which was a black a black magic two point five k. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, black magic. Cinema. Yeah, cinema camera two point five. You know, I got it used for fifteen hundred bucks. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Okay, so seriously, and it looks, you know, it looks as good as a lot of stuff out there. I'm not going to say it's the best thing I ever shot, but it's definitely acceptable. And people who've seen it, no one's ever that have watched it have ever said, wow, you know, it doesn't look as good as the Alexa or it doesn't look wow. as good as the Red. I'm like, no, they're into the story. As long as there's a basic base level production value in the way right. it's shot, which is now pre- pretty much a thousand cameras. We're, we're past the point of the DVX 100A. Yes. We're, we're, we're past the point of like, oh, it's because it's shot on this camera. We're past that point, guys, technology wise. Like we, we left that world about almost 10 years yes. ago. At this point, and and for the kid, for the kid who writes in about the pixel size, just send him five dollars. That's what I say. <laughs> you know, anybody who takes the time to, to to watch the movie and tell you that, just just send them five dollars. They'll be happy. But, you know, <laughs> you know, that's not a bad but, idea. But <laughs> good point, good point, sir. You're right. You win. You're right. That that, that you know, uh, yeah, I did shoot eight K this time yeah. because um because yeah. I'm not watching it. gosh because I'm not Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. I'm sorry. Right. I I can't afford the new the the new X you know the new whatever eight twenty five k whatever it is that they're going at now. Um. So le- go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say while we're talking about budget, I wanted to share one other one other thing that we we did. I talked a little bit about the explosions and how cheap they were, mm-hmm. but something that adds a huge amount of production value that was extremely cheap for us was doing all of the effects practical. Oh yeah. And let me give you an example. We bought a car we had to blow up a car uh-huh. and so we bought a used truck for something like 1500 maybe it was like 1700 bucks uh-huh and i'm pretty sure the guy who sold it to us thought we were going to spend the summer driving around mexico in it uh-huh. uh we blew it up the next day right but it was like that was that's a tiny fraction of the price that you'd expect to do that anywhere else you know or right. i guess people don't don't recognize that you can just buy the thing and break it and that's your price as a producer that's your price and so there were a lot of things like that that we just you know we we were able to just purchase the thing and and break it or whatnot there's a scene in the movie a fight sequence that takes place in a bathroom Mm -hmm. and we just bought bought a few of the appliances like used appliances that you'd have in a bathroom and they and they built a small set some art students helped us build a small set and everybody thinks it takes place in a real bathroom but the actual cost of the set was like a thousand bucks, you know. And you made that set, yeah. And it was just a, it was a set. We just bought some used mirrors for like thirty bucks. We bought, you know, there there were some art students who helped us, um, help design it. But it was like, you know, the actual cost of these things is not that crazy if you have, you know, a couple thousand dollars in your budget for your film and you want to do something like that. That's that's, that's insane. Now, wh- how many actual? days were you out from home like uh, full full i know it's 57 production days but how many I, months I are we? That, when i say production days i think that's i think that's the full including travel including so what travel we would, yeah because what we would do back to one of your earlier points how did we logistically do this so what we would do is we would pick the place we wanted to go we purchased the plane tickets everything about a week or two before we started filming and we laid out a schedule that had kind of buffer days when we landed in new places because we didn't know anybody there. I mean, <laughs> right, that's my point. <laughs> a bunch of the stuff we didn't know. I mean, I'd never been to Chef All right. So we, so we rolled up there at the Airbnb and we needed... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> it's, it's just... It's, a, it's nuts, so, I love it. But we, we, we rolled up at the Airbnb and we needed two people to get in a fight with us to play police officers. And, um, and so... 
So I just went down. It's a small like tourist village mm. in Morocco. And I went down to the local square and asked if there were any theater groups. And a guy like the next day was like, yeah, come back here. There's like a Shakespeare theater group that that practices here that's local. And I met two of the guys and I said, look, we're trying to make a film here. We just would need you for two scenes. And it, who's going to say no to that? You know, and of they're course. in it. Right. And the thing that also mitigated it is I was unafraid of of having people speak local languages, mm -hmm. which on a basic side, if they weren't the greatest actors that we could find, having them speak in a different language would help mask that to, to English audiences. So, and it helped, they were more comfortable doing that. So we had, we filmed the scene in Arabic and French and Spanish with these two Shakespeare actors in, in Morocco that we'd met the day before. And we did a fight sequence on the side of a hill mm -hmm. and they're like, I still have their email addresses. They were super cool. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> That's it's, 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 you, you, you blow, you blow in my mind, dude. Seriously. It's, it's something that, you know, I'm, I, I'm a little bit older than you. <laughs> when I say a little bit, I mean a lot. Um, but, and I remember being 27 and being like, when you, when you get to 37, you'll go back and you'll go, Oh my God. Yeah. What so the many. hell was I thinking? You so I always say this. Anyone who's listening out there, anyone who's young in their twenties, this is the time to do this kind of stuff because once yes. the thirties come into play, you might get married, you might have kids, the life starts Famous coming in, all of that stuff yeah. starts coming down, and you can't take as many risks as you used to because you have you know you have people counting on you as a as a as a male as a male director, uh, but as a female director as well. There's other other things uh, that happen as well. So. The twenties are the time to do this. Now you've taken things to an, a completely different level <laughs> that I ever did in my twenties. <laughs> so I, I so um, touche, sir. <laughs> no, no. So what is um? So what are some of the lessons that you did learn on this process, and that you would you would uh, warn us all about? Yeah. So I think we chatted about a few. So one is is find a name early mm -hmm. on. Find a name, any name that you can. For the film, mm -hmm. you know, whether you bring them in for a day or not, that's something that that definitely now in this side of the process and the distributor and selling it internationally side of the process, we could have done better. Okay. Um, and then I know this is probably cheesy, but and it will mean different things to each person. Mm -hmm. But I really find myself telling this to people a lot when they ask about making films and whatnot is like the number one thing you should do is make something that you love first mm -hmm. you know and and I, I talk about this in the context of like when we were in pre-production for this film you know there was like an element of me that was checking in with people in LA and and trying to chat to my Hollywood contacts about doing this and 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 maybe I should have listened more but the the way that they would have done this film and the story that they would have told Mm -hmm. was not the story that I wanted to tell mm -hmm. because they have different motives. They want to market it. They want to do this. They want to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I love, I love what I know that he's often quoted. So maybe he's controversial Casey Neistat, but he had something. Oh, I love it. I love Casey a while back. And, yeah. he, and you probably read this and he said, people email him all the time and say, Hey Casey, how do I get JetBlue to pay, pay for me to film a vlog in Thailand or around the world? Mm -hmm. And he's like, you were totally missing the point because 14 years ago, I just started making movies that I liked, that I thought were entertaining, that made me happy. Mm -hmm. And 14 years later, JetBlue is like, whoa, we will pay you to do that. But he didn't set out to be like, I want JetBlue to pay for my movies. And I think that's so important. That's a great, you know, that's a really great piece of advice, man. A lot of people think about that. They always think about like the end game, but they're not thinking about the journey. They always think about like, I want, I want a studio to give me money to make my movie. Right. And, you know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you would rather have $20 million to go make your next movie, you right. know, or 50 or a hundred million to go make your next movie. And, but a lot of people, a lot of filmmakers, it's too much. It's it, too much. yeah, that is a little too much. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to agree with you on that, but you know what I'm saying? But a lot of filmmakers go to that end game and they don't, enjoy the journey and don't like there you just have to enjoy the process and that took me 20 years to learn and the thing about blood sand and gold love it or hate it maybe you'll get well reviewed maybe it won't but because it's something that i wanted to make 
and it's because it's a story that I wanted to tell and do it in the way that I wanted to do it, Mm -hmm. I will love it no matter what and I will never regret it. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's your baby and you loved it and that's and that's all that matters. Yeah. And that's that's more important, you know, than being like, oh well, someone in Studio City right now is like, oh, it's good, but it doesn't have a name. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, whatever, this is the movie that I wanted to make. I made it. Here it is. Ex- take it for what it is. And I think Casey Neistat is that, that, that kind of story he tells is just great. It's just like set out, set out to make that first. And you know what? If someone then gives you $50 million along the way, great. Mm-hmm. It's, it's exact. Look, it's the same process I've been going through with Indie Film Hustle. You know, I just popped it up a year and a half ago. And it was a super smart move. <laughs> I mean, I popped it up a year and a half ago. And what is this? This is episode what, like one six? I don't know. <laughs> about by the time this Am I airs, two hundred. Am I two? No, we're not, not. We're not there yet. But you'll be. You you'll be in between the one forties and one fifties, probably. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So, um, which is insane, which is insane, but I love what I'm doing and I love, I enjoy helping other filmmakers. I've been doing it for a better part of a decade. I did it back in 2005 when I first started out. Uh, so it's something that's in my blood and I've always wanted to do that. And then because I'm doing what I'm enjoying, all these other opportunities have opened up. So Casey's completely right. You know, I get to, I get to meet filmmakers like you that I would have never met if I was just sitting around bitching about not making a movie or not yes. or or like oh the, the Hollywood's not doing it for me or they're not right. seeing my genius <laughs> like a lot of filmmakers say in their <laughs> their own heads um you know or you could go out and do stuff and you start making connections you start meeting people and opportunities present themselves that would have never been there just because you make you do you create action you actually it's do like, something it's like you're reading my list right here that was the last point i was going to bring up mm-hmm. about tips is that is that i know it sucks this side of it but you have to network and go and promote yourself, mm-hmm. you know, in some way, because there's not, there's just not a hidden contingent of people on the other side of the internet who are like going to just jump on the bandwagon mm-hmm. without there being some connection. And this is why I go back to be awesome, be nice when you're making your movie. There's no, there's no point on being a, a diva because everybody you touch during the film is going to be interested in seeing it. Everybody you, work with the guy that you know we that lent us his treasure chest each one of those people is is already going to be your built-in network when the movie comes out to help tell the word and help purchase it and 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 share it with people Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i mean it seems obvious but you know it's just like there's there's not there's not this hidden group of people who are like whoa i wonder what you're doing right now you know you have to really go out and like meet people and 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 tell your story and do podcasts <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So thank you. Thank you for having me on. No worries. Um, yeah. Now, um, your distributor is uh, Gravitas, right? Yes. Uh, can you tell they're us? They're great. Uh, yeah, they're awesome. We've, they're friends of the show. And uh, and what is how is that process? Because obviously you don't have a star in it, so they obviously saw some value in it to 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 pick it up. So how did that process go around? Yes. Yeah, so it was. It's that's that's been a tough process as well. So when when the film when we finally finished the film we were looking around for uh you know what to do next and we had a lot of issues with exactly show with Mm -hmm. which is people looked at it and were like ah it's just like another action movie Mm -hmm. and in this marketplace just another action movie doesn't cut it as long especially without a name attached Mm -hmm. so i think what really kind of raises the the difference is when you hear about the story of how it was made mm-hmm. and you see this as an independent film mm-hmm. um and and kind of hear about you know that really puts it in context i think as a story and and and, and film so gravitas saw that and they they picked up on that immediately and they were like this is really cool as we market this let's make sure we market you know just about how ridiculous it is that you guys made this for so little money mm-hmm. um and then the other thing they saw too, which I was hoping banking on a little bit, was they said, uh, you know, this is a genre that does really well for us. I mean, there's look, listen, Alex, there is a reason that it's called blood, sand, and gold. It is because the, the first of all, the first letters B. The first letters B, which yeah. means it's going to be very high up on your Netflix queue. I kid you not. <laughs> no, like, no, the no. It's called blood, sand, and gold is because if it's Friday night, those are the three elements that I want to see in a movie. It's as simple as that. All right. 
All right. I want to watch an action adventure movie. I want some blood. I want some sand. I want a lot of gold. <laughs> That's it. That's and you right. know, and and I love that. It's like just down to the heart of like what what we're trying to show and what if you you know if you embark on this adventure with us, what what we show off in ninety minutes. That's um, awesome. Are you going to be doing a lot of like behind the scenes, special features, any of that stuff? You are slowly rolling out a few kind of ridiculous uh, behind the scenes videos, which you can find on our Facebook page, mm-hmm. Facebook dot com slash blood sand and gold, and then our website just blood sand gold. Mm-hmm. dot com right. um, and then we also have sold there's we also have sold the film uh we have multivision air pictures who's great is an international kind of seller mm-hmm. film distributor mm-hmm. and so they sold the film it's been picked up in china in germany and then for theatrical in the uh in thailand which is like that's awesome <laughs> I, I kind of want to get the whole cast on a plane and just show up. It only costs you. It only costs you a few hundred bucks. So might as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as long as we string it together to all the territories. I, don't know, I mean, I don't know what that means theatrical in Thailand, but I'm down. I'm down to figure it out. So, in your, I know you haven't done this before, but do you do you think you're going to make some money on this? I I hope. I mean, I know that. I look. I know that my mom and dad are going to buy it. My, you know. So what there's I, that. There's that. My mom's struggling with the iTunes link. I love her to death. <laughs> She's got to wait until it goes to the Google Play Store. But wow, I'm banking on at least that. I mean, you can purchase it now on iTunes. It's the price of there's a pre-sale. It's the price of two coffees, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that would greatly help us. But it is going to come out March 10th in select theaters in the U.S. Okay, uh, and also online on video on demand at the same time on March 10th. You, so it's it's um you're doing a, a small theatrical here in the U.S. Gravitas is doing three. Three, uh, I don't know what you'd call it. Three areas, three cities, mm-hmm. I guess. Territories. Yeah. Uh, yeah, three territories. There we go. So we we don't know what those are. We find out in the next couple days. Mm-hmm. But certainly, I'm planning to go with uh, with our co stars and make some surprise appearances at whatever those theaters are. Nice. That's that's awesome, man. Why not? At least we'll be us in the. <laughs> at least we'll be us. At least, at least, at least, there's yeah. at least five, six people. At least, yeah, exactly. So, what advice uh, would you give a filmmaker just starting out in the business? I would say you have tools right now. Go out and film something. I mean, if if this podcast, if this episode, if all of these podcasts that you made teach you anything, it's that you can do this right now. You know, there's really not a point to wait. You can upload to YouTube. You already have the opportunity of an audience of worldwide mm-hmm. immediately, mm-hmm. you know, and you can film with your, your freaking phone if you want. I mean, just for me, when I went to film school, I think the thing, so many people were into the technical aspects, which is a whole beautiful side of it. Mm-hmm. But the most important thing that they taught us at, at NYU at Tisch was storytelling. Mm-hmm. And I stand by that. It's like, at the end of the day, it's like, are you going to entertain people? Mm-hmm. And, and you can do that right now with your phone. You can do that on any medium that, that, that works for you. So that's where you start. I would start right there. If you want to break in, into the business, uh, you should also listen to this podcast. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> that's, my, that's my advice. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, well, if they're listening to it, then they've already obviously. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? You're asking me just so many tough ones. <laughs> um, the lesson, I mean, look, I, I'm I'm a young guy. I'm always I'm making a lot of mistakes, and I'm I'm still trying to learn a lot. I, I really think it's the I really think it's the the Casey Neistat story that he said mm-hmm. is just make something you love first. That's that's the only thing that matters, and it, and you can't. I don't. I don't have a good metaphor, but you can't jump the gun on this. You know, no, there's, yeah, you you yeah. can't design. You cannot. My understanding now of how the film business works, from my perspective, yes, you need networking, but you can't jump the gun in terms of being like, I'm going to come up with an elaborate scheme to like scheme my way into getting a fifty million dollar film without having put in the time. You know, that doesn't work. Without having it doesn't work. It, it just it's not it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. You need to just make stuff that's entertaining or 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 that you love first and 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 you will get noticed. You will get noticed if that happens. There's a whole contingent of people. They're called agents. Right. <laughs> Managers lawyer. Right. trying to find people who are who are talented. That, so they can make money off of them. Yeah. Exactly. Bo- but, I mean, bottom line. But there is a whole group of people that combing stuff looking at viral videos looking at those people because they want to sign people who are talented mm-hmm. absolutely 
I think in this day and age, the other thing I'd say, and again, it, it sucks if you're an introvert out there listening. I hear you. I, I'm that person too. I, I try to be more private. Is is now there is a real currency online to having some kind of following. <laughs> you know, yeah. and and look, it sucks to say that, but but people are making decisions. From my understanding of what I know, people are making decisions on that based on if there is a built-in following for a product, if you have Instagram followers, if you have Facebook followers, if people like your, you know, are watching your, your video that you're putting out on YouTube. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, but true. Yeah. No, no. And I, I, it's not something that, you know, I'm still trying to figure out that I'm sure we're all, everyone's trying to figure out that, but that is, that is an element now of the networking promoting that, that people that unfortunately, if you're, if you're the introvert like me out there that you have to pay attention to. It's something that you have to very – I've done multiple podcasts about building your audience and, and, and mm-hmm. it's just imperative now, especially if you're in the low-budget world. Like you're going to try to sell something yourself through right. self-distribution. Without an audience, uh, it's, your mom and your friends are not going to be able to, to pay for that movie. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Exactly. So, um, what are your three of your favorite films of all time? Ooh, three of my favorite films of all time. I'll tell you my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite is The English Patient. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. <laughs> I love that movie. That movie is just great. Um, man, top three. I used to have a. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd say that was the, that was the top one. I, I love. I mean, I love every. I just have a, a different perspective. I mean, I think everyone does when they when they work in the film industry about movies. Mm-hmm. There's so many movies that that I it's harder to find movies that you get thoroughly immersed into mm-hmm. because you pay so much attention to how it was made and mm-hmm. what was happening behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the the curse of being a filmmaker, right? When you see a movie, like I would say, when I see a movie like The English Patient, something that I love about it is it's just, it, I just get totally immersed in it. I don't even think about how they're making stuff. Well, it's like Shawshank. Like I watch Shawshank. Yes, and Shawshank. I just, I just, I'm never, I'm not even talking about like how Frank, Frank Darabont moved the camera or how he lit the scene. I'm just in it. I'm there with Andy. I'm there with Red. And it's just magical every time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd stick it at that. That's the best. Um, now, where can people find you? So right now you can follow along with the film, facebook.com slash bloodsandgold mm-hmm. or bloodsandgold.com. And then you can also pre-order our film on iTunes right now. If you just search under the under movies or just put into iTunes, uh, Blood, Sand, and Gold, it will be available on other platforms. Um, and then I also have a Twitter handle, just Galen underscore Cannell uh, on Twitter. Perfect. And I'll put all that in the show notes, guys. So Galen, man, I can't express how much uh, it was such a great, it was such a pleasure. Yeah. It was so much fun having you on the show. I had so much fun on the show and you, <laughs> you're a real inspiration to a lot of filmmakers. That's why I always you as well. You as well. I, I, I'm still I, listening. <laughs> you've got a few to go through then my friend, if you just started. <laughs> Thanks again for being on the show. man. Well, guys, if that doesn't inspire you to go make a movie, I don't know what the hell is going to. I mean, seriously, what Galen was able to do with Blood, Sand, and Gold is remarkable. And uh, I have gotten a chance to see the movie early, and I tell you, it was uh, it was a hell of a ride. A hell of a ride. And I, I wish him nothing but the best. I can't wait to see what he does next. And if you guys want to watch the movie, it is going to be released on iTunes March 10th. So definitely go and pre-order and support indie film. Uh, absolutely, if you, just out of morbid curiosity, if you want to see how he was able to do what he did, I definitely suggest you go out and uh, either rent it or buy it on iTunes. And I'll leave a link for that in the show notes at indiefilmhustle.com forward slash one forty five. And again, there's no excuses, guys. If you want to make something happen, you can make something happen. There is no excuses. You can grab a camera. Go out and make a movie, sell it, rinse and repeat. Now, you can go at the level that I did with This Is Meg, which was a much more humble level to get the ball rolling, or you can go balls to the wall, blood, sand, and gold style and, uh, and, and do it big time. So there's a lot of different places in between there that you can land as well. Just go out and tell your story. There are no more excuses, guys, all right? Now, don't forget to head over to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking, and screenwriting audiobooks from Audible. 
And guys, also don't forget that this weekend, Saturday, March 4th, is the world premiere of This Is Meg at CineQuest. So if you guys are up in the Bay Area, please come down, visit us. We're going to be there Saturday and Sunday for our two screenings, one at 3.30 on Saturday, one at 8.30 p.m. on Sunday. And uh, me, Jill, and the whole cast is going to be there for Q&As and meetings and all that kind of cool stuff. So definitely come by and check it out. And uh, I'm really, you know, I'm really kind of excited <laughs> about this this uh, this world premiere, man, because you guys have been with me on This Is Meg since I boldly Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth uh, called my shot at the beginning of last year saying, I'm going to make a movie no matter what. And I did, and I got it into CineQuest, and we're hopefully going to be getting into some other festivals as well. But uh, to world premiere at a festival like CineQuest is, is kind of like a dream come true. And you guys have been with me this entire time, and I cannot wait to continue the journey showing you how I distribute this, how I market this, and see if we can actually make some money with This Is Meg. And uh, so I can show you that template, and hopefully you guys can replicate it as well. So... Stay tuned for that. If you want tickets, head over to the show notes and I'll leave a link in the description. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.